You know, I need to tell you that there is something going on in this world all around us every day that you and I need to be aware of. I mean, it's a matter of life and death. Whether you're a child, a young person, a senior adult, uh, we all need to be aware of this. I mean, as, uh, when it comes to the people in your life that you love and care about, this is also important for you to understand because here's the reality. There's a battle in your life and in your soul. There is a battle going on in the, in, in the lives of the people you love all around you. It is an unseen battle that is one of the primary focuses of the New Testament. Let me just read you a few verses, okay? First of all, Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And part of that prayer includes this statement. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. How serious are we about praying that we would not be led into temptation? 1 Peter 5 8 says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Do you ever feel like something's going out on outside of what you're experiencing and that what you're controlling? There is. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13 says this, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We're talking today about spiritual battles that go on all the time. And in Mark chapter 5, we have a picture of a man who is demonized. It's sort of like a cautionary tale. Be aware that this is going on, because look at this man. This is where we could all end up. We all are dealing with this in some, at some level. we got to get serious about this. On September 29, 1982, the first of seven people died in the Chicago area after taking cyanide-laced capsules of extra strength Tylenol. Does anybody remember that? Okay, I do. People went and they took the number one over-the-counter painkiller in America, and instead of making them better, it killed them. Because somebody had very uh, maliciously taken some of these bottles and they included laced with cyanide capsules and people were taking them and they were dying. Well, the leadership of Johnson & Johnson found out that this was going on, as happens in our information age, by listening to the news and being called by news reporters. What's going on with Tylenol? And so they began to investigate, and the leadership had to decide how are they going to handle this devastating situation. I mean, how could be people buy a drug from Johnson & Johnson and wonder if the, the pill they're taking was going to help them or kill them? They isolated this problem to the Chicago area, and they, of course, they began to pull all of these bottles of Tylenol. Stock of, of, of Johnson & Johnson plummeted immediately. But they went further. They not only recalled all of the Tylenol in the Chicago area, the area that was affected by this, but they actually recalled 31 million bottles of Tylenol all across the United States. Before 1982, this kind of a recall of a product had never happened before. They absolutely took responsibility and they redesigned the packaging and then they included not only a cap that you unscrew and pour out the pills, but from that point on, they included a sealed, tamper-proof uh, layer. It changed the industry. Everything has that on it now. 
They redesigned. They, they spent over $100 million while experts were telling the owners of Tylenol, you know what, you're, you're never going to you're never going to survive this. You're going to have to just rebrand, close the company, start a new one. But they decided, no, we are here to help people, and so we're going to fulfill our mission. And they, they paid a high price. But within months, the confidence of the American people in their products had began to increase and return. And their stock price, in fact, went back up to the 52-week high it had been before this happened within a couple months. Why? Because the leaders of, of uh, Johnson & Johnson, they took this seriously. They took steps to protect the customers and their products, and it made a difference. I tell you that story because you've got to know that we are in a spiritual battle, that evil exists, and evil is evil because inherent in in what it is, it only brings death and destruction, chaos, pain, suffering, separation. And it's, it's almost like in the book of Mark, we have this cautionary tale of how terrible evil can be when we look at the story of the demon-possessed man in Mark chapter 5. One of our problems, I'm not just talking about you, I'm talking about all of us, including me. One of our problems is that we, we don't fully grasp the evil of evil. We look at sin in our lives And sometimes we come to this conclusion, well, you know, I can handle a little bit of sin here and there. We feel like we can handle this or that. We we, uh, actually are often not very afraid of evil. Our friends are doing just fine, and they're doing all kinds of bad stuff. We're, we're, We're just not all that concerned about a compromise here and there. I mean, sometimes gossip... I mean, gossip, really, that, you don't need to go to jail for gossip, do you? That's not like a big, bold sin. Gossip doesn't seem all that bad. We think that a little bit of lust is okay in small do- doses. There are times when we see greed, you know, as something that's not, not bad, but, you know, sometimes that happens. There are times when we feel like a little white lie is actually even better than telling the truth. We actually live in a culture where bad isn't bad anymore. Have you noticed that? Our culture calls nothing, we call, our culture now calls wrong right and right wrong. We've come to the place that the highest value is not the standard of moral correctness, um, but tolerance and acceptance. You must never call anything wrong is the mantra of our day. You must always tolerate whatever anybody beside you wants to do. And in the book of Mark, we rediscover that evil is evil beyond our wildest imaginations. And evil left to itself is always destructive and painful and frightening. It it seems like so many times we get this idea that God is up in heaven and he picked out some arbitrary rules and regulations so that uh, you know, he would be able to tell, keep us under control. And it's really not that bad, but God said it was bad. But you know, we, the reality of why God issues his warnings is because evil is more evil than I can even tell you about. I am calling you to a way of life that will lead to your blessing, your flourishing. It will lead to healthy and positive relationships. Mark chapter 5. Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, and his disciples had just gone through a violent storm as they were headed toward this region of the Decapolis. So the, it's, it, it was a term used for this region. Um, ten cities, there were more than ten, but that's, that's the kind of the, the term that was used. 
And as they were on their way, they encountered a very frightening and violent storm. The disciples were afraid they were going to die. Jesus was asleep in the boat. They wake him up and they say, Jesus, do you not care if we all perish? Uh, Jesus says to the storm, peace be still. And it becomes absolutely quiet. And at, after this, the disciples look at each other and they realize that this man, Jesus, has the power to command the storms. And they ask each other the question, who is this man? In chapter 5, they land at this place that is in this particular passage called Gadara, the Decapolis region. And then we're going to pick it up in verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there was a man out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. The chains had been pulled apart by him, and, <clears throat> and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Um, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. But he said to him, Come out of the man. That's the first part of the story. You know, when someone was crazy back in those days, I guess the, the therapy was chain them up. Honestly, I'm glad we've, we've come further than that, but <clears throat> that's what they did. They would put them in chains and get them out of the city. Now, this man had such supernatural strength when he was chained, he could break out of his chains. No one could control him. He was a very, very scary guy. Now, when I was in California uh, to see a brand new grandbaby, I got to go to Disneyland with the two and a half year old Eleanor. She is so wonderful, had so much fun. James, uh, Tiffany, my eldest daughter, Eleanor, and I went to Disneyland. And Eleanor loves Disneyland. She loves the teacups. She, she, I can't tell you all the places that she loves. She has a great time. But there's one part of Disneyland she does not love. You know what it is? It's the Star Wars area. She told me, Papa, I cared Vader. That means I'm scared of Darth Vader. Actually, it was Kylo Ren, I've been informed. But, but I'm, I'm, it's a little bit scary. James, James loves the Star Wars area. We did all the rides in the Star Wars area. He had a blast. Eleanor does not like the Star Wars area. And when Darth Vader comes walking out on the stage at a particular area, and he's telling his captain, find the, find the informant. And he looks at the crowd and he says, they're out there. You find out which one of them is the informant. James and I are standing in the crowd. Darth Vader goes back up on the ship in a cloud of smoke. And his captain comes and looks at us all. And he, she says, I will find you. Which one of you is the informer? She comes down, down to our level. And she points right at James and says, you come here. Well, I'm not going to let James go on by himself. So <clears throat> I walk with James. And as we walk, I say, James, don't tell her anything. <laughs> now, James knows this is a play. Eleanor does not. Okay. So we get up there and she says, I need to know what you know. He says, I don't know anything. She says, okay. And she lets us go. I loved it. James loved it. We were having a blast. We were like in Star Wars. Eleanor's freaking out over there because Darth Vader, as she thinks, just walked into that ship. And But I'm going to tell you something. Much scarier than Darth Vader ever was to a two-and-a-half-year-old. 
was this guy who is screaming in the tombs, cutting himself, so supernaturally strong that when the town people try to control him, they never could because he could break out of any chains. And so they just had to let him go. And he roamed the tombs. Do you know what evil eventually does? It separates us from people. It makes us imp impossible for us to have relationships. This man is an illustration of what evil could look like if it continues to develop and expand. Sometimes we get the false idea that, you know, we can control evil. We can have our little pet sin or a little pet thing that we do. But may no, make no mistake, you can't really control it. It will eventually control you. And that's why Jesus says, I am your champion. I have come to defeat the power of evil in your life. I want to give you a life that is so blessed and so great that I have given you my word. Here is the design of life as I have prepared it. Here are the truths. And if you will follow these truths, you will be blessed beyond your imagination. Um, you know, if you're a parent here, there's a, a lesson to be learned. Evil really cannot be controlled by external laws and rules. Now, I, I get it. Um, in a household, if you're a parent, you have to have proper boundaries. You have to set the vision for your family. You have to declare what is off limits, and you have to mete out consequences because your children will never learn right and wrong unless you teach them. But make no mistake, that's not the end of your effort. It is so important for us as parents to teach our children that evil is evil because it destroys God's not a great killjoy in heaven just trying to take away all your fun. You know what? Evil seems like it's okay today, but in the end, according to James, it's going to bring a death you could never have imagined. So don't do it. Stay away from it. Don't tolerate it. Don't play with it. Because why? Because God's heart for us is absolutely good. I want to rescue you. I'm telling you, this is the right way to go. Don't violate my purpose or my design and think you're going to be headed toward a time of greater blessedness. You will not. Um, you and I actually do not have the power to restrain evil. We're helpless to overcome evil on our own. This man was helpless to overcome evil until he ran to Jesus. And that's the key. Whatever darkness you and I have deep within us, whatever struggle that we have, we, our tendency is to go and hide, but the real solution is run to Jesus. He knows you can't handle it on your own. He knows it is only with his power and his intervention that you can be delivered from something that overtakes you so easily. No one can do it without Jesus. And the other thing that this man tells us is this. There is no person beyond the redemptive power of Jesus. Do you know who became the primary preacher in the Decapolis? This formerly demon-possessed man. What? The greatest evangelist in the Decapolis was a demon-possessed man, so crazy that he ran naked and screaming in the tombs and cut himself and freaked everybody out until he met Jesus? Yeah, that's right. Whoever you are, whatever you've done, if you run to Jesus, he has the power 
to deliver you and to use you. Because while other people are ready to discard you, he sees the value he designed before you were even born. And he's not done. You know, um, the important thing is that when it comes to evil, sin is always self-destructive. Evil is always destructive. There is no such thing as constructive evil. There is no such thing as evil that puts you in the right direction. There's no such thing that, as evil that has wisdom. There's no such thing as evil that is building something that you're going to look back on later and say, wow, this was really a good thing. That's not going to happen. If you are giving yourself to even evil, you're on a path of self-destruction. The problem is evil does not always look so bad at first. For instance, has anybody here besides me ever had a down moment that a pizza couldn't solve? You know what's funny? I was, I was writing this and I get a notification on my phone from Domino's. Turns out Domino's misses me. Now, I'm an advocate for pizza. I mean, I love pizza. It's so good. But when you take something as good as a pizza and turn it into an idol to help solve your problems, you're really headed in a bad direction. You get what I'm saying? Um, when you're on the internet and you're confronted with pictures of scantily dressed women and you know this will lead you to other things, more graphic pictures, pornography, it doesn't seem so evil because it's pleasurable. But make no mistake, you're headed down a path of destruction. When you lie on your taxes, oh, is it too soon? We're still in April, right? When you lie on your taxes because you don't like the idea of paying that much money and you fantasize getting back more money than you have to give away. And anyway, you say, along with many other people, the government's always after my money. I, I just need to fight back a little bit. But honestly, the truth is you have been overtaken by a moment of greed and lying and you think it's going to be good and it's not. When gossip becomes an option for you, you're not really trying to hurt anybody, but you are sharing a little bit of information about so-and-so. You know what I'm saying, right? You, you sit there acting like you've never made that mistake. I'm not really gossiping. I'm just making people aware. Why do I know this script so well? You don't need to know. And gossip seems like it's not that big of a deal, but when you gossip about someone, the next time you meet them, you have to, you have to put on a front because you act like you're their good friend. But the truth is you've already betrayed them and you don't want them to know, so you act like a really, really good friend. And you know you're a hypocrite. And it destroys you emotionally. One reason why God chose to put the story of this demon-possessed man in the scripture is because this guy is a cautionary tale. We need the warning you know, this demon-possessed man at one time was some mother's little boy. Some father's little boy. And they loved him so much. And they had high hopes for his future. And they wanted the best for his life. But somewhere along the way, he opened the door 
he began to tolerate evil. And while he may seem like an extreme case, the truth is this is how it all begins. And he started giving in to the demons. We don't like to call them demons nowadays because we're sophisticated people. But make no mistake, the power of Satan, the spiritual powers that we're battling are real and they are present. And when we give in to evil, it eventually possesses us. So second point is this. What does this man do? He runs to Jesus. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Now, the demon had taken over this man. And it's a little confusing as you read this passage. At at what point is the man himself acting? And at what point is the demon speaking and acting? And in my experience in ministry, I've dealt with people that have had Uh, demonic uh, possession and oppression and um, it is confusing who am I talking to here is it the person or is it the evil spirit and I don't want to go into all of that but the, the point is that this man this man runs to Jesus and and Jesus begins to interact with him and then the demons clearly speak we know that because They say, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, one thing is interesting is that the disciples weren't sure who Jesus was. The people weren't sure who Jesus was. The leaders of of the Pharisees, they weren't sure who Jesus was. But in every case, the demons all knew exactly who he was. He was the son of the most high God. But then in this exchange, these demons They demand that Jesus, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now, here's the deal. Nobody gets to command God. These demons were trying to command him. Our interaction with God should not include this kind of an attitude of command. I mean, there are times when we um, are tempted to tell God what to do. Anybody here ever told God what to do? Now, <clears throat> you, you can suggest to God. You can lament before God as you deal with the problems of your life. You can tell God how much it hurts, how confused you are. But you and I cannot command God because he is God. We can entreat God. We can beg God for his help. We can appeal to God's goodness and his grace, and we should. But we do not command God. These demons were trying to command God. In verse 8, for he said to them, come out of this man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he answered him saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not that send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding near there, near, near the mountain. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at, at once, Jesus gave permission Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, and there were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Now notice that there were a lot of demons in this man. You know, the term legion is a term that was used in the Roman time, and it usually meant between four to 6,000. I don't know how many demons were in this, in this man, but it was a large number. I mean, th- this, in this particular case, though, 4,000 demonic spirits against one Jesus, the Son of the living God, is not even a power encounter. 
I mean, this was no contest. Jesus, with one word, defeats all 4,000 of them. There was no struggle. There, there was no discussion. It was a done deal because Jesus is that powerful. Whatever thing you're dealing with, if you run to Jesus and you ask him to help, he has all power and all authority to step into your life and to make a difference. Um. I love what James chapter 4, verse 7 says about how we can deal with, with the influence of evil all around us and even demonic forces. What we need to do is we just need to surrender to Jesus. We surrender to his rule, his authority, his power, his ability to defeat the evil in our lives. His heart is for us. His power is enough. He alone is our hope. In James 4, 7 it says this. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What is the number one thing you should do in the face of evil and power that is not from God? You submit to God, and then you resist the devil. And the battle's going to be taken over by Jesus. This is a picture of the power of Jesus over evil. On the cross, Jesus defeated sin, Satan, hell, and death. And in Colossians chapter 2, it says that when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus disarmed principalities and powers, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them. This was the defeat of evil. Make no mistake, Jesus is our champion, and he is our savior. And while evil creates chaos, destruction, and death, even in the pigs, when Jesus steps in, he puts things right. So those pigs, they, they, uh, they ran into the ocean, all 2,000 of them. That's a lot of pigs. In verse 14 it says, And those who fled the swine, those who, who fed the swine fled, and they told it to the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that has happened. And when they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine, and they began to plead with him to depart from their region. Does that surprise you? You know, the people who took care of the pigs, they ran back in to tell the city and eventually their bosses. And I can imagine the exchange. So, yes, bosses, we, we had the 2,000 pigs. And I'm sorry to tell you, they, they all died. Do you know what the owner of those pigs says in response? You're fired. I mean, I, I'm surely that, I, I made that up, but. You know, the sad thing is, rather than celebrate that Jesus, the great deliverer, had come to their region and had rescued this man that had been a problem for so long, and they, they ask him to leave because this hurt their economy. This is still the problem in our world. The power of Satan robs us our, of our humanity. We see how evil leads people to shoot innocent children in a school for whatever reason they carry with inside of them. Evil removes our humanity and leads us to do much harm and injure innocent people. Human trafficking is an awful thing, but why does it still exist? Because people are making so much money we hear about the fentanyl problem and there are kids that are being fed drugs that kill them 
or at least introduce them to an addiction that will forever mark their lives. But why does it continue? Because it makes money. Man's inhumanity to man is part of the result of evil. And they tell Jesus, kind of a surprising thing, please leave, please leave. And so Jesus leaves. And the third thing is this. When they got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. It is kind of surprising when this man says, Jesus, I want to go with you. Jesus says, no. I want you to go back home and I want you to tell the people what I've done and who I am and how I redeem even those people thought were too lost to ever be redeemed. Go and sit with them and talk to them. They already know who you are, but now they will see what a redeemed version of you looks like. Later on, Jesus will return to the Decapolis, and in, there's a passage, I think it's in Mark, um, eight, where Jesus feeds 4,000 people. So he returns to the place where the people said, we want you to leave, just leave here. So time passes, he goes back to the Decapolis, and at this point, there are 4,000 people that are seeking Jesus out and want to listen to what he has to say. And as Jesus teaches them, they run out of food, and Jesus feeds 4,000 men, women, and children. What, what's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. This demon-possessed man has now become the premier evangelist of the region, and people can't argue with his story because they see it. You know what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to go tell our story. Tell our story. I was talking to a young man this week, and he told me that, you know, he, he, he came to Christ as a college student, but before then, he had, uh, he had gotten addicted to pills. I said, so why did you like pills so much? He said, oh, pastor, they make you feel so good. But then I came to Christ, and I realized... I don't want that in my life anymore. And he said, you know what happened? I just stopped. I felt a supernatural help from God. There was, there was something going on beyond me. And I, I never took another pill. I know that's not everybody's story. But he, he acknowledged that his life was changed by the power of Jesus. You know, um, here's what I want to just conclude with, and, and that is this, that we all have a story. We all deal with darkness. We're all in this battle with evil. No one among us doesn't deal with, we all deal with temptation. We've all made bad decisions. We've all gotten ourselves in trouble. And the beauty of God in the gospel is Jesus says, I know, but I've come to set you free. I've come to forgive you and to make you new. If you'll come to me, I'll help you. I just want to ask if you'd bow your heads, please, as we conclude. And If you feel any darkness within you today, I want you to know you can't defeat the darkness 
on your own. And that's why you say, I'm mustering up more willpower and it doesn't work. You, you really, you know what Jesus knows about us? We are helpless to overcome evil in our lives by our own strength. And that's why Jesus says, so ask me, ask me into your life. Ask me for help. Whenever you feel that darkness come over you, whatever name it has, if you will say, Jesus, this is the darkness I'm in. I want to get out of it. But I don't have the power. But you do. So I'm asking you to help me. Don't run away from God. Run to Him. He's never said no to anyone who has come to Him. He will step into our lives and He will help us. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's where it begins. You have no idea what God's going to do. And throughout our lives, when we struggle, we, will, we need to struggle with the help of God. I want to invite you to pray with me. You know, I kind of feel like that, why not now? Why not today? Why not get the gift God wants to give today? If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you got to know that He loves you more than you will ever fully understand. He went to a cross to pay for your sin. He died. He rose again. He is powerful. And He wants to save you. Pray with me. Say, dear God in heaven, I deal with darkness in my life. I have done things that are wrong, and I admit that to you. And God, I, I just, I want you to come into my life. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You came into the world to save us. And right now, I come to you, and I surrender, and I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I invite you to come into my life. I want you to redeem me. I want you to make me your child. Save me today. Amen. If you're here today and you're struggling with anything, and believe me, believers, we all struggle, and the only hope is to come to Jesus. Would you stand, please? Um, I would love to pray with someone who, you, man, there may be people in your life you love dearly who are struggling and you're afraid for them and your heart breaks for them and you, you just want them to be rescued. You, I'm going to tell you, you, you can't lecture them into good health. You can't lecture them. You can't argue with them. Stop that. Why don't you come, even today, and let's pray for God to intervene. Won't you come?